All right, well, I'm really excited to be here. I'm up on the fourth floor with most of you guys, so it's nice to be able to share my work. I've been here for about a year doing a postdoc with Kai. Um, and before I kind of dive into all of the specific kind of research questions and things, uh, study systems, I'd like to take kind of a little bit of a global view on conservation right now. So about 15% of Earth's land surface is covered in protected areas. And that's a pretty good number. It's been increasing over the past few decades. Over the last decade, that rate of increase slowed a little bit. And it reflects our growing knowledge as conservation biologists that one of the best ways to conserve Earth's wildlife is to kind of rope off an area, make sure there's no habitat destruction, minimal resource extraction, all of that. But that 15% number sort of pales in comparison to the amount of Earth's land surface that's covered in agriculture, which sits somewhere around 40%. And for a very long time, conservation biologists have kind of viewed these systems as biological deserts. And I think it has a lot to do with kind of our preconception of what agriculture looks like. So for a lot of us, we might think of agriculture, we might think of this kind of system. So this is one of my study systems in northwest Costa Rica, um, where I'm working with Kai. And this is a sugarcane plantation. And you can basically see as far as the eye can see, it's just sugarcane. There's very little remnant vegetation here. Very little scope you would think for conserving biodiversity or wildlife in this kind of system. But not all agriculture looks like this. So here's another picture. This one is from my study sites in southern Costa Rica. And there's a lot of attributes about this landscape I'd kind of like to point out to you guys that I think make it a lot more hospitable for wildlife and a lot more um, scope for kind of conserving wildlife alongside people. So the first thing to note is that there's a substantial amount of native tropical forest here. It just exists in these smaller patches. So we've got this smaller patch of riparian area kind of going along this riparian strip towards the back and then larger fragments in the back of the photo. In our study area, um, there's only one protected area. It's about 235 hectares, so it's kind of a glorified forest fragment. And yet 35% of the region still exists as native tropical forest. It just exists on private lands. People are maintaining the forest perhaps because it's too steep to cultivate or because they draw some benefits from it. But for whatever the reason, there's a lot more forest than you would be led to believe if you were just looking at protected areas. The next thing is if you kind of see this highlighted lines coming up here, there's a lot of hedgerows or live fences demarcating these different plot boundaries. And just like up here in um, temperate zones, in the tropics, the hedgerows have been shown to be really important for maintaining birds and pollinators and lots of other types of insects. So a lot of biodiversity that can come with these kinds of hedgerows. Finally, you'll notice that it's not just one crop like that previous photo. We've got some banana, we've got some coffee interspersed in the foreground, a larger patch in the back. We've got a pasture over here on the left. So together, this is what I would call a much more diversified farming system. And it's in these kinds of systems that I would expect that we would have a lot more scope at conserving wildlife and potentially the benefits that wildlife would kind of give to growers and to the more general public. So I'm going to structure the talk today in sort of three main sections. I'm going to ask three questions. The first one is going to be a little bit more ecologically focused and just ask, you know, what kinds of species would persist in these agricultural systems and kind of how would that change among different kinds of farming systems. The second question is about, you know, the benefits that we could get from biodiversity in agricultural systems. And so for this part, we're going to key in on a particular case study in Costa Rica looking at bird and bat consumption of coffee pests and try to value that benefit. Finally, we'll think a little bit more holistically, trying to understand how you could manage these systems both for people and for nature. And for that, we'll talk not only about stuff in Costa Rica, like the previous sections, but we'll also transition and talk about some more temperate work in California. So let's start off by thinking about biodiversity in these different agricultural systems. So to get at this question, I was really fortunate to use this kind of remarkable data set of bird censuses conducted across Costa Rica. So these censuses were all compiled by the same ornithologist, Jim Zook, who's been out since 1999 counting birds along 200-meter transects 
in forest reserves, diversified farms, and intensive monocultures. And the difference between these diversified farms and intensive monocultures is exactly those differences between those pictures I showed earlier. It's, you know, the diversified farms have multiple crop types and hedgerows and patches of remnant vegetation, whereas the intensive monocultures you can think of as that vast stretching field. So Jim went out and surveyed birds in these three different land use types, and he did so all across Costa Rica in four regions, from the tropical dry forests of the north in Guanacaste down to the tropical wet forests of the south of Las Cruces. He went out six times per year, three times in the wet season, three times in the dry season, ever since 1999, and the surveys are ongoing. So hundreds of thousands of bird detections later, this is one of the largest data sets available for any neotropical vertebrate taxon at least. So we got some great scope to ask how these bird communities differ between these systems. And the simplest thing we can do is just ask, you know, how many species are present in a given transect in a different land use type. So here on the x-axis we have the year, and on the y-axis we have the average number of species detected. And what you see is this kind of remarkable thing where diversified agricultural systems host about as many species locally as forest reserves, whereas in the intensive monocultures you see an almost half the amount of species present. So this tells us that diversified agriculture might help us conserve biodiversity on the farm. But we all know that agriculture uh, is expanding and intensifying at an incredibly large spatial scale, right? We're seeing land grabs in Africa by the hundreds of thousands of hectares and huge rates of expansion in the Amazon. So if we want to think about biodiversity in agriculture, we can't just think about, you know, what's going on at a particular farm. We need to think about biodiversity at these large scales as well. And to do that, we need to think about beta diversity. So you guys might not remember from intro ecology what beta diversity is, so I'm going to go into it again. Imagine we've got two different types of forests. We've got our, you know, our wet forest and our dry forest in the north of Costa Rica. They're pretty far apart from each other and they're very different habitats, so we'd expect there to be different kinds of birds in these different systems, right? We've colored these birds differently to indicate different species. Now let's say we were to level these forests and replace them with agriculture, perhaps a pineapple plantation and a sugarcane plantation. We'd expect that there'd be a lot of birds that couldn't deal with that change and that would go locally extirpated. On the other hand, there might be some birds that could still stick around. And, you know, to a bird, the difference between sugarcane and pineapple might not be that great. There's a one vegetation layer, it's pretty homogenous. So what we could imagine seeing is something like this, where some species go locally extirpated and others spread over large distances. So even if we have the same number of species as we had before locally, we've still lost biodiversity at the large scale because these distant sites, these distinct sites, are a lot more similar in the species that occupy them. So the differences in species between sites is beta diversity, and it's the most important component of biodiversity at large spatial scales. So we looked at changes in beta diversity between the wet forests and the dry forest biomes in Costa Rica, and we measured that with this indicator of community dissimilarity. And what we found was that, again, the diversified farms hosted about as much beta diversity as the forests, but we've got a detectable decline in beta diversity in these intensive monocultures. So we're seeing that diversified agriculture can help us conserve biodiversity at these large spatial scales, but the species in intensive monocultures are kind of much more similar in very distinct regions than they would have been before. So after a couple of years working with these data, I was digging in a little bit deeper and I was realizing that, you know, while diversified agriculture has a lot of benefits, like these graphs I just showed you, the birds that occupied agricultural systems, be them diversified or intensive, were very different than the ones that occupied forests. And so we wanted to kind of get a sense of which lineages were doing well in each type of system. And to do that, we built a, a bird phylogeny of all the birds that we detected. And here you've colored the tips. Each tip is a different species according to whether it primarily affiliates with forests or diversified agriculture or intensive monocultures. And doing some basic analyses of phylogenetic signal, we could see whether there are certain groups of birds that affiliated more with one habitat type. As I said, the communities were very different between these different habitats. So, for instance, we see the ant birds, the oven birds, the mannequins, and the trogons doing really well and sort of being restricted to forests. Whereas in agricultural systems, regardless of type, you see the swallows, the seed eaters, the blackbirds, and the pigeons doing a lot better. 
And this question kind of led me to what I'm working on now here at UBC, which is trying to ask, you know, if these communities are different, do we think that, you know, all of these agricultural birds and forest birds are going to be equally affected by other kind of drivers of global change, for example, climate change? Or could we see the scenario where, you know, climate change might actually favor the same birds as agriculture, and in that way, homogenize biodiversity even more than those uh, graphs I showed earlier? That is, if we see the two primary drivers of global change sort of favoring the same species and threatening the same species, then we might see homogenization of biodiversity at these large scales. And we've got some evidence of this um, potentially going on. And I'm going to present some data that was led by one of my colleagues, uh, Luke Frischkoff, to kind of show you why we were kind of going down this line of thought. And basically, using the same data set, what we did was we first calculated the climate envelope of every bird. And so that really simply means that we would take a bird's range and we would overlay it with mean annual precipitation and mean annual temperature. And then we would calculate you know, the average temperature, the average precipitation a bird experiences across its range. And you can kind of think of that as potentially the bird's climate niche, right? And then we asked whether you know, birds from drier regions or from wetter regions did better in agriculture or in forests. And we did this in a kind of a novel modeling framework, an occupancy modeling framework, where we took advantage of the fact that this was a long-term data set and asked, you know, how well could a bird persist from year to year? So if Jim saw the bird one year, what was the likelihood he would see it the next year again? So here we've got this graph where on the x-axis we have the average precipitation a bird experiences across its range. So here on this side, on the right side of the graph, we get the wet forest birds, and here we get the more dry affiliated birds. And then on the y-axis, we have the persistence probability, the likelihood that a bird is going to be seen the next year if it was there the previous year. And what you see is this kind of really strong trend. So imagine each dot of these as a different species. For example, we've got this fiery billed arasari. This bird persists, is from kind of wetter regions, and it persists pretty well in forest reserves, but pretty poorly in agriculture. Now let's take a bird that would be from generally drier regions, like this Inca dove. Well, that bird persists pretty poorly in forest reserves, but does pretty well in agriculture. And you can see that for all these dots, they're all different species, we see this general trend of birds from drier areas doing better in agriculture. And because climate change in the neotropics is expected to increase a lot of drying, most climate models agree about that, if we were to project you know, species distributions going forward and ask what proportion of a species' current range would be habitable in the future, then we could look at you know, the differences between these forest birds and these agricultural birds. So here on the x-axis, we have the agriculture affiliation. So these are the ag birds and these are the forest birds. Okay? Each dot is still a species. And on the y-axis, we have the proportion of a bird's current range that would still be hab habitable in 2070. Each line here is a different climate model. This is one particular climate scenario, but the results held across all the climate scenarios we looked at. And here you can see this trend again where the ag birds are retaining large proportions of their range into the future, whereas the forest birds are retaining a lot less of their range in the future. So that was our first evidence that, you know, maybe climate change and land use change are actually interacting. And that's what I'm working on now here at UBC. We've set up this system in Costa Rica to try and understand how we could manage these systems in a more forward-looking manner, knowing that climate change is going to be causing some drying in the region. So how could we manage private lands to conserve bird communities as climates dry? This is ongoing work, so I don't really have any results to present you, but I'll just show you our study system. We've got this really remarkable precipitation gradient in uh, Costa Rica, where you see an almost two meter swing in annual precipitation from the coast to the interior. And we've got these 20 farms where we're counting birds, and on each one of these farms we have sites that are in forest and sites that are in agriculture. And using this kind of unique full factorial design, once we get a lot of our data in, we're gonna be able to ask questions like, well, should we try and focus our conservation efforts more in the wetter areas because those wet forest birds are probably going to do worse in the future with climate change? Or should we focus on drier areas? Does it matter the size or the configuration of the forest patches? These are the kinds of questions we're getting into now. But regardless of all of that, 
I hope that I've convinced you that there's some scope for conserving wildlife alongside people. We know that those diversified farms, while they have different birds than forest communities, we know that there are a lot of species both locally and they can maintain biodiversity at these larger scales. So what could these birds be doing for us? Let's dive into that question a little bit by asking, um, kind of looking at coffee production and whether birds and bats in this case are consuming coffee's primary pest. So why should I focus on coffee? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, it had a $90 billion retail value industry in 2011, so really economically important. About 100 million people, 20 million families make their livelihoods from its production, so from a human well-being, it's pretty important. Also very important from a land use perspective, being cultivated in more than 50 countries. And you guys might be familiar about you know, shade grown versus sun coffee and this transition towards sun coffee systems where we're seeing all of this loss of biodiversity. So this is also a nice system to ask, you know, what could that biodiversity be doing for us? So that's why we focused on coffee. The pest that we're focusing on is this guy, the coffee berry borer beetle. Now, it's only two millimeters in size, so it's, this is way, way bigger than it actually is. But it's a really important pest despite its small size. In fact, it's the most important insect pest on coffee. It burrows its way inside the coffee berries and eats it from the inside out. It's the only insect to actually consume coffee and compete with us for what we want. A lot of other ones kind of eat the leaves or other parts of the plant. Um, and so for that reason, it's by far the most economically damaging. It's been introduced to the Americas multiple times from Africa, where coffee is native, and now it's in every major coffee producing country except for China, Nepal, and Papua New Guinea. It also arrived in our study sites in Costa Rica in the year 2000, and in the southern part of Costa Rica where we're working in the year 2005. So we'll be studying predation dynamics on this pest just a few years after its arrival, which is pretty cool. So how could we tell whether birds and bats were consuming this pest and providing this benefit to coffee growers? What we did was we did this exclosure experiment where you would build cages around coffee and then monitor changes in infestation when the birds couldn't get in and eat those pests. So here you can see one of my field assistants standing on a ladder building this, building this cage to give you a sense of the scale. We had four different treatments. We had these cages that were permanently closed to exclude birds and bats. We had treatments where we would leave them closed during the day, but in the evening we would open them up so that the bats could come in and forage and then close them back up in the mornings. We had the reverse cages that would exclude the uh, bats but not the birds, and then we had open frame controls. We ran this experiment for two seasons, a wet season and a dry season, for three months each, raising and lowering those cages every day. So what do we find? Well. On the y-axis here, we've got the percent berries with the berry borer present, the percent of those berries that are destroyed, right? And you can see that before the experiment began, there were no differences between any of our treatments, which is a good thing. After the wet season, though, we saw an almost doubling of infestation upon the exclusion of birds, and really no effect of bats. In the dry season, again, we saw a doubling of infestation upon the exclusion of birds and a slight increase with bats, but it was really just marginally significant. So this was telling us that birds, but not bats, were substantially reducing boar infestations and just a few years after its arrival in Costa Rica. And if you do the economic calculations, this translates to up to about $10,000 per year in extra coffee yields that the coffee farmers could get because of these birds. So the next step is we wanted to know who the key players were here. And to get at that question, we had the not so glamorous task of sorting through a lot of bird and bat feces and looking for the DNA of the pest inside of those feces. So we looked uh, through about 1,500 poop samples. And in the end, we identified at least six, and there's probably a lot more than that, but at least six species that were consuming this pest. Here you can see them. Five of the six are residents of Costa Rica. The sixth, the yellow warbler, is a bird that you guys can see up here when it's not down in Costa Rica consuming this pest. And now that we knew which birds were the ones, or at least some of them, that were definitely consuming this pest, we could ask questions about how these birds change across the landscape and what we could do to benefit these birds. So I used a different bird census data set here, about three years of bird censuses in coffee plantations. And we basically captured these birds over three years. 
and then tallied up the number of individuals caught and found that the farms that had more forest cover surrounding them had a greater abundance of these birds, number of berry borer predator birds captured. So it looked like these berry borer eating birds were more abundant than more forested farms. Then we went out and surveyed the pests. So we looked at those six farms and a bunch of other ones. And you see this trend of you know, more forest cover around the farm, meaning less percent of berries with the berry borer present. You'll notice there's a lot of scatter here, but that's kind of what you would expect given that these farms differ in elevation and management strategies. So actually to see this as a significant trend is quite, quite remarkable. So boar infestations were less severe on more forested farms. We also looked back at the cage study and we found some evidence, at least in one season, that excluding birds actually created a bigger effect when you were near forests. So birds seem to be consuming more pests near the forest as well. So all this evidence to say that potentially we could manage this system by trying to maintain some little patches of forest in or around the coffee farms. So that kind of brings us naturally to this last section about how we could manage these agricultural uh, systems um, for both people and for nature. Now we've talked a lot about pest consumption, but birds are really important for a variety of reasons. They participate in a lot of other ecosystem functions like pollination or seed dispersal. Some of them are really evolutionarily unique and that's cool. Some of them are just really beautiful. They drive a big you know, bird watching industry. They are scavengers that pick up all of this carry-on. So they do a lot of important things and we care about them for a lot of reasons, right? So we can't just think about pest control if we're trying to manage this system. So what I tried to do is I tried to create kind of a typology of some of the different conservation objectives we might have surrounding bird conservation, especially in these neotropical areas. And so I came up with kind of five broad categories. The first one is we might want to maintain local diversity. This is the kind of aspect of diversity that people interact with in their backyard. So people might just like having a lot of species around them. We might also want to prevent global extinctions. We might want to care in particular about those species that are endemic or sort of threatened or you know, listed in some way. So we might want to target those birds in particular. We might instead care about restoring the natural community, whatever that means. So maybe in our system that means the community of birds that's present in the kind of deep dark forests that were there before humans moved in. We might also consider wanting to kind of preserve biodiversity across the tree of life, you know, making sure that we have a lot of those more ancient lineages. And finally, we might care about safeguarding ecosystem services like pest control or pollination, or maybe some of the more cultural services that are associated with these birds. Birds are play really important roles in the stories and songs and cultures of a lot of people in this area and in birdwatching tourism. So we've got these different types of objectives. And my goal was because this system was so well studied for so many years, maybe we could try and develop some indicators of all of these different conservation objectives and see how you know, different management scenarios would affect them and whether there were any trade-offs. Now, for time purposes, I'm not going to be able to show you all of the data that went into this analysis, so I'm just going to summarize it. Um, but basically what we did is we used a bird capture data set, again. This one was across you know, forest reserves, forest patches, and agriculture, mostly coffee. It's 18 different sites where we captured birds over six years. And we had a lot of other data that went into this, things like you know, the pest control work and other people working on you know, what plants birds were pollinating or what plants they were um, dispersing via eating their seeds. And we even did funny things like looked at websites for all of the the uh, bird watching tourism companies and tallied up the number of times that each species was mentioned as an indicator of how important it was for tourism. We did a similar thing with um, national newspapers looking at the common names and the scientific names and how often they appeared in national newspapers as some sort of indicator of perhaps their cultural importance. And we tagged that by whether it would be associated with a positive or with a negative connotation. But so we got all these indicators. And then we asked a couple questions. So the first one was, well, what would happen if we were to transition a coffee plantation to a forest reserve? And so, you know, if you looked at the richness of birds, you actually wouldn't see really that big of an effect. If you look at rare or endemic birds, you see that those ones are actually much more abundant in those reserves. 
So from a global diversity perspective, that might be really important. If we're considering natural birds, then quite obviously, you know, the forest birds are most often found in forests, so that one's pretty easy to understand. Also, the birds that were more evolutionarily unique, the ones that were these kind of last living remnants of ancient clades, those ones were found in forests more often. But, you know, pollinating birds, really no effect. We actually saw a slight decline in seed dispersing birds when you compared forest reserves to coffee. Same with pest eating birds. Um, remember that previous analysis that I showed you was all on coffee plantations. It was just how much forest was surrounding the coffee plantation. Birds in newspapers showed a strong negative decline. So the birds that appear very often in newspapers were the ones that people encounter in their backyards, perhaps unsurprisingly, whereas the birds that are important to bird watchers are those ones that were found in forests. So we identified all these potential trade-offs between these conservation objectives. But the powerful thing I think about doing this kind of approach is then you can kind of look at alternate approaches and see whether you could kind of reconcile some of the trade-offs. So if instead we were to preserve forest around a coffee patch or try and incentivize the farmer to have you know, some shade cover on their coffee, what would happen to all of this? And you see that this is basically the result. Almost every single uh, objective increases when you do that action except those birds in newspapers. So I think that this as a broad approach is an interesting one because it helps us understand how you know, monitoring these different objectives uh, can lead us towards these different interventions that would potentially satisfy more people. So with that, I'd like to shift gears entirely and start thinking again about a system where we're trying to manage for multiple objectives, but have a little bit less of an optimistic view than that previous one where we were saying, hey, we can get it all. Now I want to talk about a system where we're dealing with a human and wildlife conflict and what do we do in that situation. And so I'm going to tell you a story about um, something that happened in California. Well, I guess it happened throughout the U.S. in some senses. But you might remember in 2006 there was this outbreak of pathogenic E. coli in uh, fresh spinach. This outbreak was traced back to the central coast of California where most of the leafy greens are grown for the U.S. and actually a lot for Canada as well. And on one particular farm, this pathogen was found in the water, in the soil, and then also kind of critically in the feces of cattle and wild pigs. And now you can kind of get a sense of why I'm talking about this story, because this is where this big conflict originated between people and wildlife, because now pigs, and in general all wildlife, were viewed as this potential food safety problem. They could be bringing this pathogenic E. coli as well as other kinds of foodborne illnesses onto the farm field. So subsequently, there's been incredible amounts of pressure on growers from industry buyers to do everything that they could to keep wildlife off of their farm fields. So we've seen a lot of changing practices happening in the central coast of California. So some of the things that have changed. Well, the first thing is, is we see a lot of rodent traps going up along the field edges, anticoagulant rodenticides, which have a lot of cascading other problems in natural systems, but basically trying to kill off as many of the rodents as they can. A lot of fencing going up along the farm fields. Um, there's a major biological corridor along this river, the Salinas River, that goes through this area, and now that most of that is fenced. And then kind of most critically from my perspective, and then tying into kind of the work that I was just talking in Costa Rica, we've seen a huge amount of vegetation removal along the periphery of these farm fields. The idea being that this vegetation is some sort of habitat for wildlife, and if we were to get rid of it and replace it with bare ground, then maybe the wildlife wouldn't come onto the farm fields and contaminate their produce. These practices are ongoing. So in a recent survey um, of California produce growers, we found that about 40% were still reporting that they were replacing this non-crop vegetation with bare ground buffers. So we wanted to try and understand this as kind of a socio-ecological system with growers kind of at the center. So I partnered with um, some rural sociologists and governance scholars who would handle a lot more of the social work and I worked some, with some ecological type people to work on the more ecological side of this equation and we kind of tried to characterize the system of what happens when a foodborne um, disease outbreak occurs. So the first thing that happens and the most direct impact that you could have on growers is litigation. And in fact, this does happen. So a couple of years ago, when a listeria outbreak happened in cantaloupe, a bunch of um, 
produce growers or a couple of cantaloupe growers that were responsible for that outbreak were actually sued and went out of business. But that's fairly rare. That's a fairly rare impact of a foodborne outbreak on growers. Another thing though that's more common is you see some sort of new regulation coming in. So for example, in 2011, the Food Safety Modernization Act was passed in the US and it's coming into effect this year. And this will be the very first time that the FDA in the US starts regulating farming practices on the farm field and telling growers what they can't and can't do as a function of trying to increase uh, food safety. And then in our system, actually the most important driver of change on the growers is from their buyers. So buyers don't want to be associated with these foodborne diseases. So you know, if you're buying um, some Fresh Express or some um, products, some leafy greens from Costco, they don't want to associate an outbreak with any of their products. So they're going to create all of this pressure on the growers to do everything that they can to keep the conditions as sterile as, possi as possible. So what that's meant in the Central Coast is them setting up their own private standards that actually go way beyond these food safety rules and then sending out their auditors to the farm fields to enforce them. And if a grower doesn't abide by their audits then, or fails these audits, then the buyers won't buy from them at all. So incredible pressure on these growers to do whatever the buyers tell them to do. And so as a result, um, a lot of interview work done by some of my social science colleagues has shown that there's been a lot of changes with the growers. We're seeing um, some consolidation going on where the larger operations can stomach a lot of the increased costs associated with these audits, hiring food safety staff and things like that. And so the smaller producers can go out of business or sell to the larger producers and we see some consolidation going on. We also see some shifting norms um, among the growers, where the growers are beginning to view nature in some senses as, you know, this potential contamination problem and wanting more of a hospital-like, pure, sterile farm field. And because of these impacts, then we see some impacts on practices, which I outlined earlier, things like this vegetation removal. And then this can cascade back into the natural system because then we can see impacts on things that we care about, you know, like carbon storage, biodiversity, pollination, pathogens, obviously, and that's why they did this in the first place, uh, control of crop pests and water quality. A lot of, you know, vegetation is really important for filtering and sequestering some of that nutrients and sediments. So while my social scientist colleagues were focused on this side of the equation, I wanted to understand what this part would matter, how that would affect things, what would occur because of vegetation removal. So I first wanted to categorize vegetation removal, see how pervasive it is, then check out what its impact really is on pathogens, whether it's having the desired effect, and then see um, what the impacts would be on biodiversity and control of crop pests. So that's what I'm going to talk about right now. So to get at how much vegetation removal was going on, we first contracted a really fine resolution land use map of the Salinas Valley. So here is the entire Salinas Valley. So if we zoom in to this kind of red square right here, this is what it looked like in 2005. You can see there's a lot of cropland and some riparian areas along, the riparian, uh, along this main Salinas channel. Now if we're interested in food safety induced vegetation change, then we're really only interested in the vegetation change that happens along the periphery of the farm fields. That's where their farms are, kind of the farmers are clearing that bare ground area. So if we zoom in to 50 meters, if you saw 100 meters, um, it'd be about the same thing, but 50 meters from the field edge, and we look at the vegetation in 2005, and then we compare that to a remapping exercise in 2012, you can see that at least in this area, we've got a lot of riparian area replaced with bare ground buffer. And so if you integrate across the entire Salinas Valley, you see that on average, there's this 30% increase, around 30% increase in bare ground along the periphery of these farm fields between 2005 and 2012. And there's this decline in a lot of these natural or semi-natural types of habitats, which is jiving quite well with all of the interview data that we've got where the growers are saying that they're removing vegetation for this reason. So the next thing we wanted to understand was what would be going on with the pathogens. And to that, to get at that question, I compiled three different data sets. The first one was this really remarkable data set of about 240,000 tests of these foodborne pathogens on almost 75 farms from 2007 to 2013. And what the surveys were of were of this pathogenic E. coli, the kind of E. coli that gets you sick, which is called enterohemorrhagic E. coli, and salmonella, which also gets you sick. 
This was given to us by industry, by a particular corporation that wants to be anonymous for sort of obvious reasons, because we're looking at these foodborne pathogens on their farms. Um, and it's really remarkable because these pathogens are really rare, so we could only really detect them with this really, really high sample size. We also got a data set of generic E. coli, so this was, doesn't necessarily get you sick, in water, in wells and waterways, and there were about 7,000 tests, about 484 farms. And finally, we got a data set from um, an academic, a PhD student at UC Davis, who was looking at salmonella and rodents, about 800 tests on nine farms. And so the first thing that we could do, very simply, is we could ask, okay, what is the vegetation surrounding the area where that um, pathogen sample came from? And if you see more of the surrounding natural habitat, do you see an elevated risk of these pathogens? Do you see an elevated prevalence of these pathogens? So here we're using a 1.5 kilometer spatial scale and computing the fraction of cropland, grazable land, and all these different types of land in it. If you used a different spatial scale, you'd see the exact same results. So here we see the effect of cropland, grazable land, riparian areas, and other types of natural habitat on generic E. coli in water and enterohemorrhagic E. coli, the kind that gets you sick, in leafy greens. And what you see is a lot of confidence intervals overlapping zero. So really no effects of any of these land use types. The one exception is this guy right here, which shows us the more grazable land you have surrounding a farm field, the higher prevalence of pathogenic E. coli you see. Now, pathogenic E. coli came out of confined animal feedlots, so it's sort of not that surprising. And this trend of seeing more pathogenic E. coli near um, rangeland or livestock operations has been documented in the past. But for the more natural areas, no effects. When you look at salmonella, you see a very similar uh, trend again where all these confidence intervals are overlapping zero regardless if you're looking at salmonella in leafy greens or in rodents. Basically, salmonella didn't seem to be affected by surrounding land use. But because the data is temporal, we can actually take this a step further and ask a really interesting question, and that is, on the farms that removed more habitat, do you see any particular change in these foodborne pathogens? So we can go back to our land use maps, calculate the change in these different land use types between 2005 and 2012, and then look at changes in pathogens over the same time period. And that's what we've got in this graph right here. So here we've got the change in other types of natural habitat and on the x-axis, so this is farms that removed a lot of habitat, these are farms that didn't remove habitat. And on the y-axis we've got the change in pathogenic E. coli. And here you can see the exact opposite trend of what the growers were hoping for. The growers that removed more habitat actually experienced this bigger increase in pathogenic E. coli over time. Now there's a lot of scatter here. And there's this one particular point up here that looks like a lot like an outlier. If you remove it, you still see the exact same significant trend. And we were sure to kind of model the change in variance that occurs with this, um, with the change in uh, natural habitat here. But regardless of whether, you know, we do see this impact of removing vegetation actually creating an increase in pathogenic E. coli, what I think we can definitely conclude from this graph is that certainly we don't see the opposite trend. Certainly we aren't getting the result that growers are hoping for, whereby removing more vegetation creates, you know, this better situation where there's less food safety hazard and lower prevalence of foodborne pathogens. All right. So the next question we wanted to ask was, okay, if this practice doesn't seem to be working, what are the effects of this practice on other things we care about, like biodiversity or biological control? And to get at that question, we set up a new system. This one, we went out and we started growing lettuce ourselves on farms distributed across the Salinas, San Juan, and um, Pajaro Valleys, about 30 different farms. And these farms varied, again, in the amount of you know, surrounding semi-natural vegetation that would surround these sites. So we had some of these sites that were surrounded by, you know, just basically cropland and nothing but cropland. Some that had some oak woodland around them, some that had riparian areas. And because we had that land use map, we could create this indicator of the amount of semi-natural vegetation around these farm fields. And then we grew up some lettuce um, in these little plots. You can see us growing it right there. And we monitored changes in arthropods, 
So we would, at the end, when the lettuce was more mature, we would harvest the lettuce and we would wash it over this filter and collect all of the insects we could. And what we found was the more semi-natural vegetation you had around the farm field, actually the fewer insects that you captured. And you saw this slight increase in the number of different kinds, the different families of insects you captured, but it wasn't really significant. If you looked at um, pitfall traps, so these are traps where you bury a little cup in the ground and you wait for insects to crawl along the surface of the ground and fall in them, then you see this sort of similar trend where, again, you know, more semi-natural vegetation actually means fewer total insect captures. And here, actually, you do see a significant trend where more semi-natural vegetation actually increased the family level diversity of these arthropods, both at the seedling stage and at the mature lettuce stage. We only have data here when we were harvesting the lettuce plants at the mature stage. So that's why there's the difference between these graphs. So this is telling us you know, that arthropod biodiversity, at least at a family level, might increase when you have more of that natural vegetation around that growers were removing. But what about the bugs that the growers really care about, the pests? So if we zoomed in and just looked at the really important pests, aphids, you see that aphids mirror the trends of the larger um, arthropod assemblages, where the more semi-natural vegetation you have, the fewer captures of aphids in the lettuce. So basically what we're seeing is we're seeing more diverse communities um, with fewer pests in these areas that have more semi-natural vegetation. And one explanation for this could be kind of coming back to earlier in the talk, there could be biocontrol going on. You know, maybe there are other insects that are eating those um, aphids, and that's the reason why those diverse communities have fewer pests. So we did another exposure experiment. This one was designed a little bit differently because we were looking at insects this time. And so to get at this question about arthropod biocontrol, we basically started off with some lettuce plants that we were growing in our plots, and we cleaned them completely off so they had no insects on them whatsoever. Spent all the time kind of plucking off all the insects one by one. All right? Then we stocked them with some aphids, 50 aphids on each one of these plants of this potato aphid. Okay? And then we built a cage around the plant, and we monitored you know, what would happen to aphid growth in the presence and in the absence of predators. All right? And so if at the end of two weeks, we look at the ratio of the abundances of aphids in these two systems, then we can get this indicator of biocontrol. And we can ask whether that biocontrol indicator, that is the proportional reduction in aphids by their predators, whether that indicator changes along our gradient of semi-natural vegetation. And indeed, you see that as you increase the amount of semi-natural vegetation around the farm field, you see a significant increase with our biocontrol index. That is, we see these predatory insects eating more aphids on these farms that are um, surrounded by more semi-natural vegetation. All right. So when we think about this system in California, We've seen that this one practice of removing habitat is not really a good one, either from a food safety perspective, from a conservation perspective, or really from a food production perspective either, if you care about pest control. So what could we do to manage food safety in this system in a more kind of co-management type of lens? Well, I think there's a lot of interesting kind of opportunities for future work here. The first thing that we could think about is actually maintaining the vegetation or installing treatment wetlands. So we saw in that preliminary data, remember, where it looked like the sites that actually maintain that vegetation had the smallest increase in these pathogens over time. And indeed, there's been some more focused experimental work in this landscape where you know, they would install a grass filter strip and then put some pathogens upstream and then watch it filter them out. So that can definitely happen, and I think some more work should look into this. There's also, it's pretty well established that treatment wetlands are a pretty good way to control some of the foodborne pathogens running off, off from confined animal feedlots. So that might be another option when you have concentrated operations. But we did see this effect of the grazable land, so what could we do about that? Well, one of the things is we could try and buffer our more vulnerable crops with some more appropriate crops, you know, things like wheat or corn or things that are, you know, cooked before they're consumed, and so we don't really need to worry about foodborne pathogens. We could also try and attract the, uh, the cattle away from the streams upstream by putting their food or water troughs away from them or fencing those streams. Um, 
then maybe their feces wouldn't get into the water that would then go downstream and potentially be used either for irrigation or during a flooding event go onto the farm fields. Finally, we could think about trying to incentivize the vaccination of cattle. This would obviously require some partnerships between the downstream produce growers and the upstream livestock operators, ranchers, because you know this is a costly um, practice and these guys would be benefiting from it. So you need to link them together somehow. But what I think we can kind of agree on, or I hope we can mostly agree on, is that there is some scope for kind of co-managing the system, both for food safety goals, goals, but also for some of the food production and conservation goals that we might have in this system. So I'd like to basically kind of wrap up by looking back at these questions and basically kind of looking at them and saying, well, you know, the first question, can species persist in sort of what types of agricultural systems? Yes, I think they definitely can, and we've seen them be able to in diversified agriculture. Second, we've seen how biodiversity could contribute benefits to people by regulating pests. And then finally, we've taken this kind of more multi-objective lens and looked at what kinds of, kind of interventions we could have to try and satisfy the multiple goals we have in agricultural systems. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys and take any questions. It's a percentage change, yeah. That's a great question. I always get that one. Yeah, so that's a really, really tricky one because then we got to get into this whole cost-benefit analysis of, you know, um, of the advantages of having forest around these farm fields. And I think to do that, you need to really get, you need to monitor a lot of things. So you need to understand what the costs are of expanding that agriculture into those areas. A lot of times there, at least in Costa Rica, it's a lot more steeper slopes. So, you know, it's more marginal lands that, um, that is left generally. Um, in, if we're talking about putting in new systems, then that would obviously not necessarily apply. But then we'd need to balance out not only, you know, the pest control, but in this system in Costa Rica as, and also in um, Salinas Valley, we've seen much higher rates of pollination coming in with um, added natural habitat in the landscape. So you need to factor that in. Maybe we could get some sort of carbon market going and getting extra uh, sequestration. So you need to start stacking these services. So you're totally right. The, the cost of foregone, the opportunity cost of foregone production is probably not going to weigh out against pest control, but maybe if you stack that with a bunch of other things, you could see something. But we haven't done that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the, um, so the question, I realized I should have been repeating questions. The question was about occupancy models and where the data came from for that. Um, the data came from that same data set that I was presenting um, for the whole beginning part of that talk. So those many years of bird censuses across Costa Rica. Um, we're starting a new effort. That's what I've been working on here in the northwestern part, that little section that I showed up there. And we're going to be doing some occupancy modeling with those data that actually just came in last week. So that'll be fun. The, uh, that is an amazing story, the bird data set you mean, right? Yeah, so it's 
a really cool story that how did I get my hands on that data set? So when I was a freshman in college, um, starting as an undergrad, I uh, signed up to do some data entry work um, in Gretchen Daly's lab and did it for a quarter entering all of these bird censuses and then burned out and was like, I want to do my own work. And then I never actually worked in that lab again. Never met Gretchen, um, was working with you know, one of her PhD students. And then you know, four years later, I was applying for PhD programs. And I really loved Gretchen's work. And so I applied to work with her. And I'd never met her before. And so I go to interview with her. And um, she says, you know, I really like your ideas about pest control, but I've got this really long-term data set that nobody actually has ever analyzed because everyone, you know, all of my PhD students have just developed their own projects, and it'd be great if you could just work on it a little bit. And it's like, show me a data, show me a data sheet. And she's like, what are you talking about? And so she runs off and grabs the data sheet and brings it back. Turns out it was the data that I was entering as a freshman. <laughs> so yeah, I've had. I've, been working with that data for a long time, not the whole duration, but yeah, I have no idea why or how it could have gone unanalyzed for so long, but it did, and I really benefited from it. Yeah. No, he is fully, he is, a, he is one of the best, ornith, probably the best ornithologist in, um, or well-known well ornithologist in Costa Rica. And his job is to do surveys for Gretchen. And that's what he's been doing since 1999. He's, t he's done some other things along the side along the way. Yeah. Yeah, and now we've got him doing surveys for us for this project. So he's doing both, which is great. I know several people will have to leave at 1.30, so why don't we do one or maybe two quick questions and then Danny are you able to do yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, the question was about what? Yeah. 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 For uh, the question was about co-management and kind of speaking a little bit more concretely about what the scope there is for doing that in um, either Costa Rica or California. I'm going to say California because it's a way easier example and it's a much more policy relevant thing going on. Um, it's a very interesting scenario where if you think about the incentives, there's actually no incentive to continue removing this vegetation because it's not effective, um, it's costly, and it's environmentally detrimental. Uh, there's been a big group of people trying to talk about co-managing food safety and environmental issues for a long time in this system, mostly focused around water quality, worrying that all of this vegetation removal is going to impact a lot of the nutrient and sediment runoff. Um, and it's been really tough. They've been trying to, you know, come up with all of these different options and butting heads with industry. So I naively thought that when I had published this thing or when I came up with this uh, finding that it didn't work, that this was just going to be the solution and that uh, this problem was just going to go away. And we did a lot of outreach and, you know, tried to get it um, into the hands of a lot of people that really matter. Um, but there was still a lot of resistance, but the resistance was just because people, you know, were sort of steadfast in the way that they've been thinking for a long time. And we're beginning to see a little bit of change, I think. And I think it's by really, what I realized was that you really need to work with the social scientists to understand where the levers are in the system. So once we realized that it was really the buyers that had so much control, for example, we went and um, administered a couple, you know, conference type calls with some of the really big high ups in some of these organizations to try and explain to them what we did and what we found and what the limitations were um, so that they could understand what was going on and make it a lot more accessible given that it was published in you know a uh, scientific journal even though we did you know press type of stuff um, and they seemed really receptive to it when we talked to them um, we'll see whether it has a uh, impact in the future <laughs>